Well, I, oh, it's, well. I'll follow your lead. Good evening, Duncan. We've been looking after, looking forward to this one for some time. So, I think without further ado, just please carry on and introduce yourself and fire away. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you very much for having me, and um, it's it's an honour to be here, albeit virtually. Edinburgh is one of my favourite cities. I, I grew up in the northeast of England in Darlington, and some of my family. Uh, from that part of the world, so I have very lots of happy memories of of going to Edinburgh as a kid, and uh, still still get there as often as I can. So I'm sorry I can't be with you in person, but it's an honour to be here and to tell you about fast radio bursts, uh, what we're calling an evolving cosmic mystery, um, and just to um, it, just to get you everyone up to speed, what they are are intense flashes of radio waves. Um, and so that so those are out of the visible spectrum, uh, long wavelength part of the electromagnetic spectrum, and they are typically observed using large uh, radio antenna like this one shown here, the Parkes Radio Telescope in New South Wales, Australia. Here is an artist's impression of the the bright flash that the radio telescope is detecting. This is the band of the Milky Way uh, as seen in radio. Um, waves. Uh, in, so you, in, rather than looking at stars there, you're looking at the, um, the shells of supernova remnants uh, after stars have exploded. They, they, are they shine much brighter in the radio than the actual stars, the optical stars do themselves. Um, but what you can see here is that the, the fast radio burst is away from the Milky Way. It's just in a, in a random part of the sky. Uh, and as we'll see, there are new phenomena that are going off um, basically randomly all over the sky and we've learned about them since 2007 and uh, what I'll present to you today is a kind of a, a history of the um, the adventures that we've had in that time and, and what we've learned about them so far there's still a lot of things that we don't know they have a lot of potential um, so um, yes just to sh just to get you uh, oriented um, you know, you're perhaps used to looking in the visible part of the spectrum um, with optical telescopes on the ground and getting beautiful images from space. Um, the, the types of telescopes that I deal with, um, you know, as a student, I went to the Jodrell Bank Observatory. That's where I got my postgraduate degree in Cheshire. Uh, and they have uh, the 76 meter telescope there. Uh, where I am now in West Virginia, I'm about two hours away from the, the Green Bank Telescope, which is a large radio facility over here in the US. Um, and these, these telescopes um, are collecting much longer, lower energy parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. And you get, um, by going to all the effort of, of looking at that part of the spectrum, you get a complementary um, picture of the universe of whatever object you're studying, there is information to be gleaned that is not available necessarily in all of these other bands, the infrared, uh, visible, we're used to ultraviolet x-ray through to gamma rays. So we're very, uh, we're very much going to be focusing on the, uh, the low energy part of the spectrum tonight. Um, I will, I do want to, uh, while I'm looking at the spectrum here, and we just mentioned gamma rays, um, point out that the, the fast radio bursts in some ways are the analogs of um, gamma ray bursts, which many of you will be familiar with, the random flashes of light in the gamma ray sky. Um, there may be a connection between those two sources, um, but they, they, they share some similarities uh, at, the, at the very least. Uh, so that's a good thing to keep in the back of your mind uh, as we go forward. Here is another picture of the radio sky uh, from the Green Bank Observatory. Uh, like I say, it's close to my uh, home here in Morgantown, West Virginia. And you're looking at the, the night sky there. Uh, and rather than every pinpoint of light being a, you know, a regular star like our sun, what, they, what you're actually looking at is, are different galaxies. So this is the sky uh, that's imaged uh, in five centimeter radio waves. Um, and you can also see uh, some of these expanding shells of gas from, from, from nearby galactic supernova remnants. But most of the objects that we see when we make a radio image of the sky are very much distant 
uh, more distant than the, uh, the sources in the Milky Way, um, billions of light years away in some cases. Um, and so it's quite a different uh, picture that you get. Uh, again, it helps you to understand the universe. Uh, and the phenomenon that I am um, you know, going to talk to you about tonight, fast radio burst, you can imagine as just popping up in random patches of this sky, roughly speaking, once every 20 seconds, one of these will go off. They only last for a few milliseconds, a few thousandths of a second. Um, but they put out more energy in that time than the sun, our nearest star does in one month. So they're, they're pretty energetic. They're not super energetic like the, uh, the gamma ray bursts, which are putting out even more energy, but they're, they're getting up there. Um, now to, to try to help you, you know, wrap your head around this, there's a little audio file that I'm going to play. Uh, I'll just play a little snippet for first. All right, so what you heard there was a kind of a rumbling sound, I hope. And uh, that rumbling sound represents the, the noise in the, in the electronics, um, which is coming from just the thermal motion of the electrons in the, in the telescope electronic system themselves, um, but also from just random uh, radio signals that are coming from the sky. So it's like, like a, a cosmic hiss, if you like, is, you know, like, like when you tune your radio, uh, around through the AM or FM bands, you get this, um, uh, particularly in AM, you get this static. Uh, so some of that static is actually coming from the universe itself. Now, I'm going to play for you an audio version of what a fast radio burst sounds like. I'm just going to skip forward a little bit and I'll just play it again and we'll listen to a few. Uh, if I can get this to play. Okay, um, so what you were hearing there that sort of superimposed upon that static uh, were these chirp signals, sort of a uh, Some of them are really short duration. They were, they, they were over more quickly than others. Um, some of them were, were brighter than others. You could, they were audibly louder than others. Um, and it's, it's a simulation um, of what the radio, um, the fast radio bursts would sound like if your ears were able to detect those radio frequencies. And so what you were hearing was the highest frequency pitch was coming in first. That's why it makes that chirp sound. And then the lowest frequency radio waves arrive later. So you get a like a, a downward uh, moving uh, pitch. A little bit like when a, um, um, uh, a police car, you know, moves away from you and you, you get that doctor shift. It's a little bit like that. Um, anyway, that's, that's kind of the phenomenon. They're, all, they're, they're over in a few um, thousandths of a second. Um, and in many cases, they're not seen again. Um, so they're very hard, uh, uh, difficult objects to study. Uh, and in order to uh, understand how, we've, how we even found them in the first place, we do have to go back in time about 50 50 odd years. Um, back to this image here, which shows the crab supernova remnant. So this is an expanding shell of gas um, that was produced when a star exploded, whose light we first saw in 1054 AD. Our ancestors, um, particularly in China, uh, were very diligent about logging this. They saw a guest star in the sky that was visible for a couple of weeks. Um, when you look at that position now, you see this, you don't see a star anymore, you see an expanding shell of gas, which is the remnants of the star after it had exploded. And what I have been studying and, and many of my colleagues over the years are the, um, the compact cores left over from those supernova explosions. These are known as pulsars. Um, and they were first discovered in 1967 by Josh, Jocelyn Bell, who was a student working with Anthony Hewish in Cambridge. Um, 
they turn out to be rapidly spinning um, neutron stars. And so this is a star that has about the size, the mass of the sun, but the size of a city center or, or an inner city area, about um, 10, 20 kilometer radius. So you have an extraordinarily uh, dense object that's spinning very rapidly. It, it has a high, very large magnetic field and it's able to generate radio waves that um, flash, uh, that, that emanate from the source. Uh, and what you see are pulses uh, of radio um, emission um, that uh, are produced as the, the beam of the star, the magnetic poles sweep past your line of sight each time the star rotates. So you get these pulses from the star uh, and those pulsars, they're absolutely fascinating objects to, to, to study. We've known about them for 50 years. Uh, they're, they populate our galaxy, our Milky Way galaxy mostly. Um, and we've learned a whole lot about them. You should definitely get a speaker um, to talk about them uh, at some point. I can recommend a few names later on if you, if you like. But um, the pulsars were, were very interesting right from the get-go. And this particular source here in 1968, uh, when people started looking at the Crab Nebula, they found a pulsar in the center. And this particular one was emitting what we call giant radio pulses that were actually thousands of times greater than the average pulse that goes past your line of sight. So people were thinking even way back then that these giant pulses could be detected not only from nearby objects like the Crab Nebula, but they could, actually, they could also be detectable in distant galaxies uh, from similar sources. So people have been looking for these giant pulses for a, lo a long time. Um, back in the 70s, a paper came out um, by Finney and Taylor, um, and they were looking for radio pulses that, that are produced when primordial black holes explode. So primordial black holes were, were hypothesized as a result of Stephen Hawking's um, um, development of um, the radiation mechanism from a black hole. That is that um, black holes that were formed in the, in the early universe that were about the mass of the earth will be evaporating through the Hawking process and some of those will be actually um, fin releasing the, the rest of their energy um, at, this, at the current cosmic time. So here's an artist's impression of one of those uh, black hole explosions, uh, if you will. Uh, and they, they emit an, ele an electromagnetic pulse that in principle can go out into the universe uh, and be detectable at all, all across the electromagnetic spectrum. So they're fascinating objects to, uh, to think about. They've never been directly observed, but people started looking for them, um, looking for pulses from them as, as far back as 1979. Um, in fast forward to 2003, people, the people that were working in that field got really busy um, understanding pulsars and, and spending a lot of their time um, studying those. Um, but at the beginning of you know, the new millennium, people again started to think about these giant pulses. Here is a graph just showing um, the pulses from pulsars uh, in this little, this little uh, blob here, what you're, what the, what's being plotted here is, is the luminosity, the intrinsic brightness of the, um, the, the pulses versus something that's approximately their pulse width. It's on a logarithmic scale. So if you're familiar with logarithm, log logarithmic plotting, you'll know that this, this actually spans many, many orders of magnitude. It's actually 23 powers of 10 that are being <laughs> um, displayed on the, the vertical axis. Uh, and 18 powers of 10 on the, the horizontal axis. What this diagram is trying to do is to show you where these pulses live in this sort of what, what physicists call a, a phase space. Um, the pulsars live down here. These giant pulses from the crab and some other objects are kind of off the, the beaten path there. But people started thinking about pulses that could be way up here, that could be generated by even more energetic processes like these uh, evaporating Black holes. And so uh, a paper came out uh, around this time uh, that discussed a number of techniques that, you, that I'll, I'll show you um, to look for these pulses uh, and made some interesting predictions about radio bursting objects uh, in distant galaxies, which we've now found. Well, uh, around about that time, um, 
I was uh, at the Jodrell Bank Observatory, uh, that's where I was working uh, with this team here uh, involving um, my wife, um, who's also an astronomer, and, and, and she and I were involved in this team where we were looking for individual pulses from um, galactic sources. So we, we carried out a, a survey of the Milky Way looking for just individual pulses um, that could be coming from these, these giant pulsing stars. And we found a, a whole bunch of them. Here's a couple of examples here. Uh, and so this is radio frequency versus time. It's important to note that there is about, it's about half a second uh, of time on, on the, the bottom left plot here. So it's a very, very small um, moment in time that you're looking at here. And here is the pulse that you could hear, the type of pulses that you could hear in that, in that audio animation, uh, that audio simulation that I gave you. So it's the, the highest frequency is arriving first and the lowest frequency later. When you add all these pulses together, what you find um, is an individual pulse that is bright enough to be detectable above the background noise, Here's an even brighter one. Um, and so we started finding these, um, these pulses. We called them rotating radio transients. They, they were kind of close cousins to pulsars and we believe that they're from the same phenomenon. Um, but we're, by discovering them, we were, we were seeing a different part of this neutron star population. So it was a very exciting time. Um, and a couple of years after that, my wife and I moved to uh, West Virginia, where we're, we've been ever since. And uh, actually, I should have said I'm coming to you live from my basement today. Um, and we, we got here in 2006, uh, starting out as uh, assistant professors in the, in the physics department. And we wanted to find projects to give to our students. Um, and so there was a really interesting data set that was available back then. Um, that was looking for radio pulses, not in the Milky Way, but in the Magellanic Clouds, so our nearest neighbor galaxies, <clears throat> these dwarf galaxies that are orbiting the Milky Way. And this team here found 14 of them, which added to an already growing population of pulsars in the Magellanic Clouds. But we noticed that they hadn't been searched for individual radio pulses. Um, so we wanted to get working on research projects straight away, so we, they kindly gave us the copy of the data and we started looking for it. The data were collected with a, uh, a, a rather interesting radio camera that you can see here. It's being hoist up into the focus box of the Parkes radio telescope. So the cameras that we have on our phones you know, have millions of pixels. This one, you can count them here. These, these circles are individual pixels. There's 13 pixels in this camera which sounds you know, a little bit uh, on the low side, but uh, what you're actually getting you know, in real terms are 13 different views of the sky for the price of one effectively. So that the throughput of the telescope has been improved. Um, when you point it on the sky, it makes this sort of footprint that you can see down here. Here is the burst that we eventually found. It was detected in uh, these three, three different um, uh, pointings uh, simultaneously, and we'll come back to that uh, in a few moments. But it was a it was a really nice data set, uh, and we were in the we were in a position to to, to do something new with it, and um, we started to um, put together this pipeline, which is you know just a bit of jargon for a, you know a computer program that takes uh, that reads in some data, processes it in some way, and then gives you some results based on what you're trying to do with the data. And, and so in this case, we were looking for individual pulses. And if you look here, you see the radio frequency versus time. Uh, this, is the, this, is, this is how the incoming data look like. So, so a pulse would be sort of coming down this, you can see I've just highlighted a, a line here. They would be coming down a line whose slope that we don't, we don't actually know. Um, the, 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 the amount of chirp, the, the, the amount by which the, the signal changes in pitch depends on, on the, the slope here. And the slope itself uh, depends upon how far away the sources are from us. So one thing I didn't mention earlier on is the further away from that the source is from, from us, 
the longer that chirp signal will take. So it, it would be a would be a nearby one and a would be a would be a more distant one. And what's happening is that the the signal it's traveling, it's taking millions or billions of years in some cases to to traverse the universe uh, and it's interacting with electrons along the way and the more electrons the signal interacts with uh, it slows it down depending on the frequency and so the further away the signal um, the, um, the more delay you observe. We quantify that delay by something known as DM which stands for dispersion measure in this case uh, and so we we basically guess uh, at what the delay might be. And what we do is we add up the signal along a certain track, uh, compress it all down to what we call a de-dispersed time series. And then we search for pulses in that time series. So what we've done there is that we've, um, we've looked for pulses that are you know, statistically significantly above the, the, the background noise. In this particular case, you don't see anything that's popping out there. So what you have to do is you have to go back to the original data and you have to search a different delay, so a different DM, a different dispersion measure, add the data up in a different way, and go, you go around in a loop like this. And so the computer program is, is set up to do that. <clears throat> it takes this incoming data, it, com it, it combines it in various ways, uh, and searches it. And then the result of the search is shown down here, at this, uh, this so-called diagnostic plot. Um, so this is not the, the pretty radio image that we see in, from our optical friends. This is our, um, our dirty um, single dish radio astronomy image, but it, it contains a lot of information here. So let me just go through it with you. Uh, what, what's going along the bottom here is time. So it's 300 seconds uh, here. So this is about six, six and a half minutes worth of data here. Um, and you see these little white um, circles here. Those are just sort of background, uh, very low significance pulses that are just a little bit above the noise. The bigger the symbol that, that is shown in that plot, the, the, the bigger the circle. Uh, and once the, once the pulse gets away from the noise, then we color code it, uh, we make it darker. And so these dark splodges are, re are really bright individual pulses that are well above the noise level. So you see there's this band of pulses here, and there's also this band of pulses down here. So what we've done here is we've, um, we've plotted the data in terms of the dispersion measure. So the best way to think about this axis, this is time, this is distance really. Uh, so the further away the signal is, the higher up in this diagram it will appear. So all this stuff down at the bottom here is actually locally generated interference. So it's coming from, um, you know, electric fences and things like that, and uh, things that are nearby that are generating uh, radio pulses. They, so they don't have much of a dispersive delay. They're, they're very nearby. This is the astronomical signal. In this case, it's a pulsar. And so you're seeing individual pulses from a test pulsar. So this is just a test observation to make sure that the the thing is working. So we, um, we put together this search and um, we found very quickly uh, something rather unexpected. Um, here's, here's, so here's an actual observation from the survey. So rather than being a few minutes, this is one hour now, this is like two and a half hours of data. Uh, and so here's time and distance again is in this way. So we saw this really bright pulse, just an individual pulse that was well above the noise, it was 10 times further up this diagram than would be expected from the electrons in the, in the, from, in the Milky Way or in the Magellanic Clouds. Uh, and it was a really, uh, a really unexpected thing. We weren't expecting to see anything here at all. What we actually, uh, what we actually ended up, when we went back to the data, we saw that we were looking at this pointing here, which was kind of a bonus pointing that was collected to the south of the, this, this is the small Magellanic cloud here. So we found this signal in three of the pointings, um, three of the beams down here. And when you look at the, the signal uh, in terms of the frequency time plot that I showed before for those other sources, you, know, you see this very clear sweep, um, which is unmistakable um, um, evidence that it is of uh, astronomical origin. Um, 
And when you add up all of those channels, all of those frequency channels, you get this bright pulse here. So this was about 2006. Here's a younger version of me um, with a copy of the, the paper that we wrote uh, and an undergraduate student, David Narkovic, uh, who, who was the one analyzing the data. Um, and so we made this bold um, claim back then that we'd found this object of extra galactic origin. We knew it had to be extra galactic because of the, the sheer amount of delay that we were observing in here. If it was coming from our Milky Way, the delay would be much less. If it was in the Magellanic Clouds, it, the delay would be greater, but still nowhere near as great as what we're seeing here. Um, and it really had all of the hallmarks of an astronomical signal. So we got really excited and we, we made some bold claims. We, we, we looked at the, that spot in the sky for over 90 hours and didn't see any uh, additional bursts. Um, and uh, it was just a, a very exciting uh, few months. Uh, and um, I, I still remember it as though it was yesterday. So one of the, um, the implications of this result was that there, would, there should be other pulses present in, in these data sets. And people started looking for these pulses uh, and they did indeed find some, but they weren't the kind of pulses that people were looking for, people really expected. Um, so here's a paper um, that came out a few years after this in 2011 now, um, showing three different pulses here that kind of had a similar characteristic to the, to the one I showed you, except they were present in all 13 beams of the, the radio uh, telescope. And that's something, and we'll get back to that shortly, that, that you don't expect for a, a really a true astronomical signal. What made it also rather strange is that the, when you looked at the delay, you made a histogram of the delay of these events, you found that they clustered around the, the same delay that we measured for our original one, which at that point had had um, got my name attached to it. And um, these, op these events, they were clearly not astronomical in origin because of the, um, they were appearing in all pixels of the camera. Uh, and so they were, um, but people didn't know what they were originally. Uh, and they were dubbed peritons after this mythical Greek uh, beast that casts a human shadow. So something that's masquerading as something else. Um, so things were, uh, you know, this was four years after the original discovery. It was taking a long time for this story to pan out. Um, so things were quite, were quite strained. There were no other examples that looked like this. They were only, the only ones found were looking like this, you know, and, and uh, times at home were quite, uh, were quite tough back then too. Even my, my own wife began to doubt me at one point. Here's a paper that she wrote with some of her colleagues um, where they looked for other examples of these pulses and could not find anything but these peritons. And so this one-off burst uh, was you know, starting, to, uh, starting to gather a bit of dust. Um, what, uh, what really saved, saved the field and kind of catapulted it into its next phase was um, this paper here that came out by Evan Keane in 2013, where they found another pulse just an individual pulse with a completely different delay. Um, I didn't mention this before, but the, the value of the delay can be cast in something called the, the dispersion measure, which in these, these units here is 746. The original one was 375. So it was a completely different delay. Um, and then shortly after that, um, four other pulses were found by this, this team that's shown here. And here are the four individual pulses. Now, when you, um, you can contrast these pulses with, the, with what is known about the radio pulsa, pulsars in this graph down here. So when you make a graph of dispersion measure, which again, think about this as the distance to the source. So the further away the source is, the, the larger the, dis the dispersion measure. If you graph that against the, the, la the galactic latitude, so the angle that your source is with respect to the galactic plane, so it goes plus or minus 90 degrees. All of these red points here, these are galactic pulsars. And so they, they fall within the band of the Milky Way. These now, here's the original burst, here's the second one, and here are these four new ones. These six objects here, these are the fast radio bursts 
Um, and you can see that they're occupying a completely different part of the, again, this phase space um, and uh, showing that they're really a distinct population. Um, so they were known, they were dubbed fast radio bursts at that time. Uh, and this is the, really, the first paper that really kind of sealed their um, presence as a population. And also, um, you know, really hammered home this idea that they were, they, they were originating from well beyond the Milky Way. So why cosmological? Well, <clears throat> the amount of delay is simply too great. Um, the, the dispersive delay is simply too great to be explained by just electrons in the Milky Way. What happens if the source is traveling across the universe? Well, it undergoes what we, what we call cosmological redshift, uh, which is explained uh, in this diagram here. So imagine that the, that the source is leaving this host galaxy and it's traveling towards the Earth. As the source um, reaches the Earth, uh, it takes such a long time to do that because of the vast distance across the universe. The universe itself, we know, is expanding. So the universe has expanded significantly in that time. And so we, rather than measuring the redshift um, that, that was at, that, at which the source was emitted at, we measure an observed redshift, which is longer than the, the emitted wavelength. So what's happening here is that the source has been physically stretched out, uh, that the, the wavelength has been, has been increased by the, uh, by the expanding universe. And we, we represent that expansion by what we call redshift here, Z, as the observed wavelength minus the emitted wavelength divided by the emitted wavelength. So if you think about that for a second, it's the fractional increase in wavelength. Um, and if you rearrange this, um, and you know, you see that this um, emitted divided by emitted can be moved over to this side. You get something that one plus z is the observed over the emitted wavelength. So a redshift of zero, one plus zero would be one. Uh, that means that the observed wavelength is the same as the emitted wavelength. That's something nearby. A redshift of one, so z equals one, one plus one equals two. That means the observed wavelength is twice as big as the emitted wavelength. It means the the universe has doubled in size since the source was emitted. So if you're able to measure these redshifts to these sources, uh, you're able to understand how far away they are and you start to learn things about the large scale structure of the universe that we'll, we'll come to now. <coughs> so for fast radio bursts themselves, you don't immediately get a direct measurement of the redshift, you get an estimate of the redshift. Uh, and you can do that, um, it's so kind of shown in this little rule of thumb here that the redshift is the dispersion measure divided by a thousand. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, astrophysical background that's gone into that estimate. But take it from me that if you divide that number that you, you can read off the graph. So in this particular case, it was 375 was our dispersive delay. Uh, divide that by a thousand, you get a redshift of 0.375. And so that's a very rough estimate of the distance. It's not a measurement of the distance. It's an, it's an estimate. Um, but it, it allows you to estimate the energy scale. Um, so for example, if you have a DM of 500, um, it's a redshift of 0.5. That turns out to be emitted 5 billion light years ago. Uh, and that for a typical fast radio burst, the, the amount of energy that, that was released that would uh, result in what you observe <coughs> is about a month of the sun's output. So there's a lot of information there. Um, we, uh, what we, what I'm going to move to the latter part of this talk now is to show you some of the exciting results that have, have happened since then. Um, and to show you how we can actually measure the, uh, the redshifts of these sources and not just estimate them. So things started to, to increase rapidly in, uh, after those discoveries were made. In 2014, uh, a fast radio burst was found at Arecibo, um, the radio telescope in Puerto Rico. This one was notable because it actually was the first one to show repeat bursts. All of the dozen or so that were known at that time had only been seen to, to burst once. So they were one-off objects. I'll come back to the, to the repetition in a, in a second. Um, but you might be wondering what happened to the peritons. Well, in 2015, people finally figured out what was causing those signals that were producing the, um, the output in all, all of the, the, the pixels of the telescope. Um, 
if you open a microwave oven before it has finished its cycle, you know, you get impatient and you open the, the door and pull out your drink uh, or whatever it is, what, what happens is you, the microwave is still uh, working and it emits an electromagnetic pulse. It, com it comes out of the Faraday cage that, that, that the door was shielding. Um, so what happens is that pulse leaves the microwave and can be detectable. Um, so what was happening here was that in, this is the Parkes telescope here and the, um, the visitor center has a restaurant uh, and in that restaurant, there are some microwave ovens and people eventually realized that those microwave ovens were emitting radio signals. They, the, the technology had gotten fast enough that they, that, that they could detect these radio bursts in real time. Uh, and so they, then, they, then they, um, they took a look at all of the detections and they realized that the, that the peritons, they peaked around lunchtime in the... Uh, in, this is uh, local time in Australia. And these uh, cyan symbols are the fast radio bursts, which have no knowledge of lunchtime. And why would they? Because they're coming from far across the universe. The original uh, fast radio burst, uh, the one that we found is, is one of these ones in this bin here. So the peritons were, were kind of put to bed at that point and they were realized they were this form of local interference. But the radio bursts, the fast radio bursts remain uh, an enigma and what a choice one has when trying to explain these things. At one point, there were way more theories than there were actually bursts known. So I've got a laundry list of theories here. And each of these bullet points, in fact, has a lot of sub theories, you know, little variations on a, on a particular explanation. I'm not going to get into the details of all of these because it would take many hours. <clears throat> but suffice to say, what you need is something that's compact, something that's able to produce a, a few millisecond burst, has to be a few light milliseconds across, it has to be small. So it can't be a galaxy, a whole galaxy. Uh, it, it's a stretch even um, to have a, a large star like the sun produce. It has to be a small patch uh, of um, a small region of space that, that produces these, um, these compact bursts. And so, it also has to be something that's extremely energetic. Um, so a neutron star is really good at that. It's got a lot of gravitational energy. It's got a lot of magnetic energy. Black holes, um, they, they, have a lot, they have a lot of gravitational energy themselves. Um, white dwarfs, these compact stars, they also have a lot of, lot of energy. Um, so there are many scenarios you can have. So you can, you can collide two neutron stars together and that will produce an electromagnetic pulse. A supernova can go off that can produce an electromagnetic pulse and so on and so forth. And you see that there are lots of things here. Dark matter is even in there. Cosmic strings, these large scale defects in, in the fabric of space time. So not necessarily things to do with stars. Uh, extraterrestrials are also mentioned at the bottom there because it, it was realized that <laughs> they could, the energetics were such that you could have a, you know, an, um, an extraterrestrial explosion that goes off um, that would produce a, about this, the right amount of energy. There are many other arguments against that now that we're seeing these bursts that I'll show you um, that it's more, it's a, it's a natural phenomenon. So back to this one that repeats, this is so-called FRB 121102, 2012, November 2nd. That's where it gets its name from. This is the one that was found at Arecibo. It was the first one that was found that actually repeats. So more than one burst. And so what that means in terms of these theories that I just showed you is that um, theories that involve one-off events like an explosion or, a or an in-spiral of two stars, it's very hard to get multiple bursts from those, especially separated over months or now years that we've been observing this one. But you could um, get multiple bursts from <coughs> um, a neutron star that, that is just occasionally emitting a really bright giant pulse That's, or, or other, other explanations are possible. But what, what we learned from this, this single burst is that it's unlikely to be due to, to cataclysmic events, uh, at least that particular source. The other thing that happened when this burst was going off multiple times is that people could localize it really well on the sky. Up until that point with the large radio telescopes that we used, you couldn't actually localize it to within an angular scale um, better than the, the full moon. 
Um, so it, you couldn't say, oh, the burst is coming from that star or that galaxy. It wasn't good enough. With the repeating source, um, they were able to use um, the very large array in New Mexico and other so-called radio interferometers to make a really high resolution image of the radio sky and pinpoint the burst. And you could say with certain it's coming from that galaxy. And so that's what happened here. Um, they were able to localize it to this particular galaxy. Uh, this is an optical image, and that's the galaxy containing this fast radio burst. That is suddenly a game-changing moment because optical astronomers know how to measure the redshift to, to galaxies. They've been doing that for years and years from analysis of the optical, the spectral lines and the optical light. Uh, and so that allowed people very quickly to, to measure directly the distance to this source, the redshift to it uh, of 0.19, and that puts it about 2.3 billion light years away. So there was no doubt at that point that they were coming from well beyond the Milky Way. And so what's happened since then, and this is only three years ago, two years ago, uh, my last few slides now, um, is that people have started observing these bursts all across the, the globe with different types of telescopes. So ASCAP, the Australian Square Kilometer Array Pathfinder is a network of dishes, relatively small uh, 12 meter dishes that um, are in the, um, the Western Australian outback uh, and have been used uh, now to discover dozens and dozens of FRBs. <laughs> the first 20 that they found came from an initial survey here and that was a that suddenly boosted the sample from like 20 objects to 40. So it was a very groundbreaking moment. Um, what's happening now uh, is another telescope is really making a lot of headlines in the news. It's called CHIME, the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment, a great acronym. And it's these uh, cylindrical uh, array, it's an array of uh, cylinders here. Um, rather than a dish, a movable dish, the array itself just sits on the ground uh, and this uh, horizontal um, uh, plane here is filled with radio receivers. And so what this telescope is able to do is it's able to monitor the sky, a huge swath of the sky, no less, not just a degree, but hundreds and hundreds of degrees uh, as, it is, uh, as the earth is rotating. And so it sees for about 20 minutes every day, a spot on the sky, and it can pinpoint it with you know, reasonable accuracy. Um, not, not great, but it, what, it, what it really excels at right now is that it, see, it sees so much of the sky, so much more of the sky than previous telescopes, that it's able to find many, many more bursts. And uh, the, the first catalog is eagerly awaited now, and it's, it has 700 bursts in it. Here are some of the first detections of these, these bursts. Um, and it has a big part to play in this story. Um, it found, for instance, uh, very recently, uh, the nearest uh, extragalactic fast radio burst, uh, which is shown here. It's localized to within this spiral arm of this galaxy that's uh, cosmologically speaking, right next door, it's a redshift of 0 0.0037. Um, and uh, it's starting to, um, there's a wealth of observational results that are coming off that telescope. Uh, and one of the things that they're finding is that some of these repeating sources, there are about 20 of them now, <coughs> one or two of them are repeating periodically. That is that they, um, they switch on in their activity uh, in a fairly well-defined window. Um, and so these little um, um, uh, vertical bands here are the, the windows at which the source is active um, and has been, and pulses have been detected from this. And so this, this particular one is, has a 16 day um, periodicity as, attached to it. Um, so again, it's providing some very vital clues as to what these sources are. Some other very recent news is that the nearest FRB is actually within the Milky Way itself. Um, so redshift zero. Um, and it was found um, by a, a very small radio telescope because this, the source itself is so bright that you can detect it with a you know, very, just a backyard radio telescope. It's thousands of times brighter than the, than the ones that I've been talking about up to now. It turns out 
and here it is in, back in this this diagram that I showed you before. There's the pulsars. These are the, the uh, giant radio pulses. Notice how that the fast radio bursts have now populated this part of the diagram. It sits up here. It's just just off to the edge of this diagram, so it's slightly fainter than the the rest of the fast radio bursts. But it's really not very far away. So it, the um, the implication is that as we find more of these, we'll see that there is a continuum of, um, of sources across this, uh, this space here. So um, this, is, this is the so-called galactic fast radio burst. And it's coming from, the reason it was, it was identified was it, it's also triggered with a galactic uh, magnetar. So this is a highly magnetized neutron star that is, that is known to emit flares across the electromagnetic spectrum. If you listen very carefully, there's, that's not a fast radio burst, that's my parrot. <laughs> he was immediately <laughs> in the floor above me. I'll try to speak on, he's, I think he's quietened down. Um, anyway, um, so lots of, lots of very, um, very, lots of results coming in, uh, you know, as we speak, literally. Um, one, a uh, couple of slides and, uh, to close with, one, one amazing result that's, that's come out now is the so-called Makar relationship. Um, that is that um, the, the field has reached a certain state now where there's been enough um, identifications of host galaxies uh, and redshifts have been measured that you can make a, a statistically meaningful graph showing the redshifts of the bursts versus the dispersion measure that we're uh, um, that we're able to see from these bursts. And so, what you see here, these are individual fast radio bursts that have been detected, and the redshifts have been directly measured. And so, they fall along a very nice correlation, which is expected based on our, on on our prior knowledge of cosmology, but so far hasn't been directly observed. And so this is a so-called detection of the, what, what's known in, in astrophysics as the missing baryons. You know, the parrot's gone into overdrive now. Um, and these, uh, so these baryons are, are, are like basically tra it's tracing material in the space between, between the galaxies. So this is a fundamental breakthrough. Uh, it's, it's named after uh, J.P. Makar, uh, et al, who, who published this, um, this relationship. And very sadly, JP uh, passed this year at a, at a tragically young age, but this relationship has been named in his honor because he really, really established the, the veracity of it. I just want to end by saying that the, the future of this field is very bright. Uh, I've given you a lot of results here in a short uh, period of time. We had a meeting uh, of the field this, this past uh, July. It was supposed to take place in Thailand uh, back in the spring, but the pandemic had other ideas about that. So we, we eventually were forced to meet online. And so here is a collection of all, our, all of our Zoom portraits and has been photoshopped onto a fast radio burst. Um, it really serves to give you um, a, fee, a flavor of how many people are working in this field. There's, there's probably a couple of hundred people at this point that are pretty active and several hundred others that are you know, are, are interested in it. Um, it's, it's a very, it's a rapidly growing field. It's bringing in uh, a very diverse population, people who are not necessarily astronomers, but are coming at it from like the data science side of things. Um, physicists who are looking at more fundamental applications and many, it's a, it's a really interesting intersection. So the next 10 years of the field is uh, no doubt there's gonna be a lot of surprises in, in store. Um, before I close, I, I do want to thank you uh, in general, any, anyone listening you know, live and, and later on, as the work that we do as scientists would not be possible without, um, in our case here in the US, federal support from the National Science Foundation, but in every other country in the world, um, the scientists, they, they, we all write grants to support our, our research, and that comes from tax dollars that the citizens pay. So I'm always indebted to to you as taxpayers for supporting this work. It could not happen without us, uh, without you. Um, we, get, um, but we get support at the state level here in, in the state of West Virginia. And a lot of my research has been supported by um, um, a foundation in Arizona, the Research Corporation for Scientific Advancement. 
So thank you to all of you. Uh, thank you very much for listening and I'd be very happy to, to take questions. Thank you very much, Duncan. That was absolutely fascinating. Can we all unmute and uh, give Duncan our appreciation and then we'll do the question. So uh, over to questions. What, what, I had a question. I was wondering if there was any relationship between the fast radio bursts and any other major bursts or uh, phenomenal. Yes, I, I think... Um... You know, gamma ray bursts are um, a top among the, the contenders for that people are looking at to see if there's a relationship. You know, I, with, this, um, with this galactic fast radio burst that I presented towards the end here, we have for the first time um, made a direct connection with bursts, um, in this case from a magnetar, a highly magnetized neutron star that are coming from the high energy part of the spectrum. So this is the one source where we see a direct connection. Right. Um, so it's very strong evidence that at least some of the fast radio bursts are coming from these magnetars. Thank you. Uh, I think we have a question from Carl. Yeah, Carl, thanks. thanks, thanks, Peter. Um, Professor Larimer, that, that was an excellent talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I was wondering at the very start, you said that your the so the sources weren't in the galactic plane. Where are they? Where not not physically? Yeah, they're what, coming what does from, that mean? They're coming from all over the sky. So um, you know, there's there's no there's no preferred location on the sky. So you know, imagine that you you have a population of sources um in the in the galaxy right mm -hmm. they they would be um they would they would be formed or produced by stars in the milky way let's say they would be associated with the band of the milky way and so they would be in a particular part of the sky but here the sources are so far away that there's no preferred location that they they have no knowledge of our galactic coordinate system so they're they're just coming from distant distant parts of the universe and one one direction is just as likely as another to, to produce All right. the first video. So actually not, see, not seeing them from any preferred direction is actually telling you that, that they yeah. must be very far away. It's supporting evidence. I mean, the other, I, you could spin that around and say they're actually really close uh, because then you wouldn't see the band of the Milky Way if they were really close. And that's what happened with gamma ray bursts a long time ago. But now that the redshifts have been measured and the dispersion measures are so large, they really have to be far away. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. Carl. Sean, do you have a question? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, thanks very much. That was a, a fascinating uh, uh, talk tonight. Uh, it was really just uh, about the, because this is such a new science uh, or a new branch of, of, of astronomy, um, the, the large extragalactic sources um is it possible that studying that could actually tell us stuff about the structure of the universe outside our galaxy, whether that be, you know, the composition of other galaxies or indeed the extragalactic space between galaxies? I'm just wondering what the, the implications are for our cosmology more generally. Yes, no, there's, that's a great question. There, there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of excitement about that as, as fast radio bursts being used as, as tools to study the cosmos. They, the, this Makar relationship that I mentioned here at the end, you know, is one part of that. And so, the uh, it the relationship has the form that it has because of the um, the electron content of the space between galaxies. And so we're we're directly measuring that. So that's one one nice thing you can do. You can also, <laughs> and this has been done on, uh, a couple of times so far, but you can measure the the polarization. Um, of the radio waves, so the the to see if there's a preferred orientation of the electromagnetic signal, and if there is, then what that, what that's telling you is that the magnetic field along the line of sight uh, has a certain um, average value, and so if you can make those detections for different, you know, imagine looking at different parts of the sky, you start to to do a, a map of the universe's large scale magnetic structure as well. Um, so we've done that for many years with uh, pulsars and, and mapped out the magnetic field of the galaxy using pulsars. 
with fast radio bursts, we hope to be able to do the same for the universe. So there are, you know, things like that are, are certainly possible. People are thinking about many different tests that you can do with fast radio bursts. And they, I think 10 years from now, they, they should have um, fulfilled their potential in many ways and they'll be kind of part of a cosmologist's toolbox. Thank you for that. Uh, Jonathan Smith, would you like to ask unmute and ask your question? Yes, uh, thank you for, the, for that talk. Uh, my question was about gravity waves. Am I getting this right? You could could you uh, correlate a, a gravity wave event to a fast uh, radio burst? Um, is the propagation speed the same that you could you could uh, link the two in, in future? Yeah, they, they both should propagate with the speed of light. Um, you know, the, the the fast radio bursts have this delay because of the dispersive effect uh, of the <laughs> intervening electrons, um, but we are actively um, looking for correlations with the, the gravitational wave sky, so events in the gravitational wave sky. And so people are taking the catalogs of fast radio bursts and they're looking for coincidences. So, you know, if some of them are due to, let's say, in spiraling neutron stars, then you would expect, you know, to see a fast radio, um, uh, the gravitational waves followed by the, um, the radio signal very shortly thereafter. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that, Mark. Any YouTube questions? Yes, I'll, I'll, um, I'll see a couple here. Yeah. Um, Biswaji, I hope I pronounced that right, who's uh, watching us from India, um, has a couple of questions which I'll lump together. One is, um, what are the present challenges and problems of um, research into fast radio bursts and what is the future of the research? And also, um, it sounds like he wants to be a part of that because he says, um, what opportunities are available for freshers such as him? <laughs> <laughs> yeah that that's a great question there's there are a lot of challenges and you know within within astronomy and astrophysics in general um a lot of the um the topics are now starting to become limited by <coughs> uh or challenged i should say by what what people can do with large quantities of data and how well they can manipulate those the, the instruments that are now being deployed on the sky all across the the electromagnetic spectrum and in gravitational waves, they're collecting vast quantities of data. So fast radio bursts are no different. Um, and so it, the data, it's a data processing challenge. Um, we have, we are constantly um, having to refine our algorithms to reject sources of interference from the data. You know, that's, that's the, you know, radio interference for us is like the, um, the stray light for optic problem for op in optical astronomy. It's something that we have to mitigate against, and it, it's gradually getting worse as you know as more people are broadcasting or using the electromagnetic spectrum to broadcast. Um, so there are a lot of challenges like that. Theoretically, there are huge you know it's a, there are many challenges and possibilities to trying to understand the the relate the um, the mechanisms of fast radio bursts. You know, are there multiple classes of fast radio bursts is a, is a open question. So there are lots of topics to dive into, you know, it, it, depending on where you are, um, you can get involved. Um, you know, if you if you're at a uh, if you're at a university already, you know, you can talk to your advisor. And the nice thing about, you know, the way astronomy works these days is the Internet makes makes things like this possible, but it also makes um, uh, collaboration is possible, you know, across continents. And so, you know, your advisor could reach out to, to someone over here, let's say, and, you know, we, we, we could find some, some data to, to look at and things like that. So, yeah, I think it's a, it's a great time to be getting into this field. Okay, thank you. Uh, Morris asks, um, why do we never hear of neutron stars having Hawking evap evaporation too? There's strong gravity in a small space it should work the same way? Yes, so the, the, the difference between a neutron star and a black hole is a neutron star does not have an event horizon. So the, the point of no return at which, beyond which not even light can pass. So that the Hawking process is a direct result of the event horizon from a black hole. So a pair of virtual particles gets created around the event horizon. One goes into the, um, into the black hole, the other leaves. And so it, 
when you look at it from when you look at the black hole from a distance, it looks as though the uh, the, the black hole has radiated the particle. Uh, but what's happened is that the, the particle has escaped, but the, there's an energy debt that the black hole pay, pays. Uh, and that's a direct consequence of having this, this event horizon. So neutron stars don't have an event horizon. They're very strong. You wouldn't want to be close to them because of their strong gravitational field, but they do not generate any, any Hawking radiation. And one last question from Ms. Wajit again. Um, what is it about FRBs that we think is so important? Why are we researching it so much? Is there something we think could be very special about them? Well, I think it's they allow us to uh, to measure the universe in a way that we just can't do otherwise. So this this Makar relationship is an example of that. You know, it's it would it's it's providing us a new window on the universe, and we're always looking for for ways to further our understanding. Um, you know, the, inter, intellectually, you know, it's it's just you want to know what these things are. They're just so fascinating. Just just to think about. You know, every 20 seconds, there's one of these bursts going off randomly around the sky. You know, what on earth is going on? So there's that intellectual challenge that drives it. Um, and then as you learn about them as a population, you will um, be able to put them in context with other um, stellar populations. You know, let's say we can, um, we, we find out that a, a good fraction of them come from magnetars. By studying fast radio bursts, we now have a new window into the magnetar phenomenon. And, you know, it just things just build from there. We, you know, will um, will undoubtedly find uh, many new, many surprises over the coming decade that we just simply aren't thinking about right now. And uh, so we have to we have to constantly keep an open mind. So, yeah, it's just uh, there are just many many things that we can imagine already and many things that we we can only dream about. Well, that sounds like a great point to, to finish. Uh, I think, uh, thanks very much, Duncan. Yeah. I think we should un unmute and clap again if we can, or wave or whatever. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, a, a tremendous uh, session to start our new year with. So thank you very much for that as well. And we're certainly open to suggestions on speakers from you, as you mentioned earlier, and uh, Carl will be on you to get them, I think. Won't you, Carl? Thank you. Yes, I, I'm sure I'll be, I'll be picking your brains, Professor. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to do that. So thank you very much for that. And uh, you're welcome to stay with us. We're, we're going to look at the sky in September now for, uh, so that people know what to look up at. I would love to. I've got. I've got to duck out. I have to be elsewhere. But thank you very much for having me. Oh, thank you. Thanks again. Exactly. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, good. Thank you. Okay, over oh. to you, Alan. You have to share your screen. Okay. Okay. I'm going to share my screen. Right, can you see that? Yes. Yep. Right. Let me bring up my presenter screen. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this is the sky in September for this year, uh, and not a view of the sky you're used to, but one that we can gener generate using Stellarium, showing the constellation patterns. You may recognize Cygnus, the Swan, Aquila, the Eagle, and Lyra, uh, the Lyre. Uh, and there are two planets down there, Saturn and Jupiter uh, in Sagittarius, and I'll draw your attention to the shield, which I'll come back to uh, later. My usual star chart is this one. This is the one that appears uh, in the Sky in September note on the ASE's webpage with my notes that also appeared in, in this month's Scots, in the Scotsman for this month. The um, one point I always make, uh, one uh, uh, asterism I always highlight is the plough uh, up here in, in the northern sky, but in the south, here's a summer triangle looking rather squashed, formed by the bright stars Deneb, Vega and Altair, and another asterism and that half of the sky is a square of Pegasus. Again, it's looking a little bit squashed on this, on this projection. Down in the south, though, we have the two planets, Saturn and Jupiter. And now we also have a planet in the eastern sky in the evening, and that's it, uh, Mars uh, in Pisces. Now, last month, Mark uh, started off by talking about the sun 
and the moon. I thought that was a good idea. So I pinched a bit of, of <laughs> the sort of presentation he gave. Uh, this is a, 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 a a, a list of uh, sunrise sunset times and twilight times for the month uh, from Dominic Ford's in the sky.org which you can certainly recommend as a as a uh, resource for working out when uh, sunrise sunset times occur and also when civil nautical and astronomical twilights occur I think we can call we can say nautical is effective darkness and you'll see that nautical twilight is, is falling earlier each, each uh, night by, by about 90 minutes during the month uh, in, the in the evening. And in the morning, it's, it's uh, getting uh, dark, uh, uh, getting light rather uh, later. So the nights, effective nights are getting longer. Of course, the sun is moving southwards and this month it uh, crosses the equator of the sky at the uh, autumnal equinox that comes on September the 22nd when they say that night, days and nights are equal around the world at 12 hours each, uh, whatever your latitude. The moon this month, these are the phases of the moon this month. Uh, we had a full moon on September the 2nd and the middle period of the month is the moon is a period when around new moon between last quarter and first quarter when the sky is fairly dark. So we have a uh, we can see the fainter stars if you can get away from street lighting. There's another full moon on the 1st of October. Now, uh, in most Septembers, the full moon in September is uh, called the harvest moon. But uh, the, the definition is that the harvest moon is a full moon occurring closest to the autumnal equinox. And it's the full moon on the 1st of October, which is the harvest moon. Uh, that's the one that occurs closest to the autumnal equinox. Mark also showed this diagram last month. It's been updated to show the sky on the 15th of September with the sun uh, in the middle here, the area around it, of course, hidden in the daylight. But this is the central, this is the equatorial regions of the sky stretched out the full 360 degrees, 180 degrees away from the sun in each direction and showing where the planets are. This curving line is the ecliptic, the path of the the apparent path of the sun uh, through the sky as the Earth orbits it. And you'll see now the sun is heading in this direction, southwards and crossing the equator. Of the planets this month, Mercury is hidden in our evening sky. We're not going to see it from Scotland. It's too low down at sunset in the twilight. You're not going to see it. But two, the two planets I've already mentioned, Jupiter and Saturn, are nicely placed in the evening sky on this side of the sun. And uh, there they are. Uh, at, at the middle of the month, their sizes and brightnesses, relative sizes shown here. Uh, Jupiter is a good 42 arc seconds wide, so you'll have no difficulty spotting, uh, seeing its spots and streaks through a, a telescope. It's more difficult for Saturn, it's smaller, but the rings are, uh, are not, still fairly wide open, and you can see the shadow uh, of the globe on the rings uh, on to the, uh, to, the, to the east side of, of the planet. These are the views the right way up. Uh, Mars is approaching opposition, not quite there yet, and growing in size as it gets nearer. These are the views on the 1st and 30th of September. It's brightening from magnitude minus 1.8 to minus 2.4. And since Jupiter is fading slightly by the end of the month, Mars will outshine Jupiter. And of course, Mars is, is reddish in hue. Jupiter is not, it's more whitish. Venus is in the morning sky. Uh, to the west of the sun and quite high in the sky but getting further away as it uh, recedes from the earth it's, it's, uh, as it's passed it's past the it's, it's already passed in front of the sun uh, on the near side of the sun and it's now receding around its orbit so it's getting smaller at the moment it's uh, about the same size as Mars but it's going to get quite a bit smaller by the end of the month. Let's look in the northern sky at 23 hours BST at the, at the beginning of the month, but this chart is also good for these times, September the 16th at 22 hours BST and October the 1st at 21 hours BST. You'll see that uh, the brightest star in this region is Capella uh, in the north northeast in the constellation Auriga. The Milky Way, in fact, although it isn't shown on this diagram, is falling right down from the overhead point through Cassiopeia and Perseus through, through Auriga. Over here we have the plough and I'll highlight that because I want to focus a little bit on the plough. Here it is in a close-up 
the seven stars of the plow named, we know that these N2 stars, we call the pointers, point up to Polaris, which is off the screen at the top. But I've also plotted here several uh, objects which are good photogenic uh, uh, targets uh, in uh, galaxies mainly uh, around this area of sky. Lots of interesting uh, galaxies. Plus uh, down here, there's M3, which is a, a, a globular cluster. Sixth magnitude globular cluster as visible as a small fuzzy globe through, uh, globe through binoculars. For the galaxies, you do need a telescope, but they are nicely photogenic. I want to focus on Mizar, the second star in the handle of the plough, because that's uh, a famous double star, a naked eye double star. And it's one of the ASE 24 targets. If you check the website, you'll find there are 24 uh, targets uh, in, in the sky for people to, to look out for. And this is one of them. Uh, it sometimes held as a test of eyesight. Uh, I guess it's better than driving to Bernard Castle. Um, the two stars there are 12 arc seconds, arc, sorry, arc minutes in separation, Alcor and Mizar, which is about a third of a moon diameter. Um, and in, in reality, they're about uh, a third of a light year apart and 83 light years away from us. Alcor is a binary star. It has a faint, it has a magnitude 8.8 .8 red dwarf companion only one arc second away. And, and I think it's remarkable that this was only first seen in 2009. It's, uh, and it needed quite a large telescope to spot it. Mazar is doubled through any of our telescopes. Um, it's... Uh, the two stars there are magnitude 2.2 and magnitude 3.9, and it is thought that they revolve around each other. They take thousands of years to do so. And each of these is itself uh, a spectroscopic uh, binary, uh, which means you need a, a spectroscope uh, and to, to tell that there are two, each of these is actually two stars. So Mizar is a four star system, Alcor is a two star system. Together they make a, a six star multiple star system. We turn our attention to the west at the same time. Here is the plough uh, in the northwest, about to swing below Polaris in the north. The brightest star down here is Arcturus, and that's in the western sky at nightfall and sinking down. And that's just marginally brighter than Vega and Capella. In the south, well, uh, I've already mentioned the Summer Triangle formed by Dene, Vega and Altair, high in the south. Uh, the most obvious object in this area, apart from the moon, which was over here in Aquarius on the 1st of September, the most obvious object though is, is Jupiter. Much less obvious is the fact that the Milky Way is flowing up through this area uh, from uh, Sagittarius and Scorpius down here uh, through uh, Scutum and through the Sil uh, Summer Triangle and right past Deneb. The chart sadly doesn't show the Milky Way, but John Watson of the Society imaged it quite recently and posted this picture on our Flickr group on, uh, on, on the net. Uh, here is the Summer Triangle. Uh, well, can you spot it there? Well, I'll give you a clue. It's tilted. It's tilted over to the left. Uh, okay, I'll put on some lines to help you. There you are, Vega, Deneb and Altair. This darker region through the middle is the Great Rift. Uh, it's a, a river of darkness that uh, uh, follows the line, the center line of the Milky Way. It's made up of gas and dust in the galactic plane, which hides uh, the more distant stars. Uh, in this area, it's called, also called the Cygnus Rift, but the Great Rift, as the continuation around the sky, uh, extends for about a third of the way around the sky. Here are the constellations marked out, Cygnus, Lyra, and Aquila. Um, another object in the ASE 24 is the double star Epsilon Lyra, double double, here not far from Vega. And also there is, uh, near there, just about there, is M57, uh, the ring nebula, a planetary nebula, uh, the, the, uh, uh, a smoke ring, if you like, around a star. Uh, this was photographed by Nigel Goodman, and again, posted this picture on our Flickr group. It's this object in the middle of this image and I've taken the liberty of expanding it, enlarging it, so you can see that it really, what the Ring Nebula really looks like. 
back here, there is one object here that I, I like to I like to pick out, but I don't think it is in our ASC 24, and that's the Cotanga, which is this pattern of stars there. It's on the line between Altair and Vega, very easily to, easy to find, about a third the way from Altair to Vega. Uh, and it's uh, it's got various alternative names, and that's a close up uh, of it, I an mean, image of it with its various names. It's called Broches Cluster or Colander 399, and it's in the constellation of Vulpecula. It was once thought this was a real star cluster, but now we know those stars are not related. They're just aligned like that uh, by chance. And it does look like an upside down Kotanga. There's the bar to hold your shirt and there's the, the loop uh, uh, below it, which would, uh, which would hang on the, the rail. Back to this view. And I want to concentrate just now on the area around Altair and below and to the right of Altair, because this includes this region, uh, which is the shield, Scoot and the shield. And in there is a famous wild duck cluster, Messier 11. It's an unusually rich cluster. That means it's got plenty of stars. It, it's quite massive and it's compact, quite, quite small for its mass. Uh, the name, uh, the wild duck cluster comes, was given to it by, or was given to it by a, an account uh, in, in a book by the Admiral W.H. Smythe. Uh, I don't think it's any relation to the, the news agent. W.H. Smythe, a celebrated Royal Naval officer, and uh, he wrote a book, The Cycle of Celestial Objects, and he likened it to a flight of wild ducks. This is his uh, drawing of the cluster. And more recently, uh, this is a, a more modern image, and I think you can just about make out some arcs of stars in there. That's a more modern cluster. It's a more modern image. It's around 6,120 light years away. The stars in it formed 300 million years ago, and it's got the mass of about 11,000 stars. The HST has also imaged at least part of it, and there it is, the HST, HST image, the Hubble Space Telescope. The fainter stars, the little tiny dots in the background, are probably background stars in the Milky Way, uh, which is particularly bright as it flows through Scutum. And now let's concentrate again on Jupiter and Saturn. Here the two are, the relative sizes are correct. Uh, and uh, you'll see that uh, both planets are pretty well fixed in position this month. They're stationary, in fact. They've been uh, moving uh, for the last few weeks. They've been moving westwards. And this month they halt and start to move eastwards again. Uh, Saturn, sorry, Jupiter is stationary on the 13th of September. Uh, Saturn is stationary on the 29th. And at that time, the motions switch from uh, westerly to easterly. And Fran Goodman uh, imaged the two planets. I think these are them down here uh, on the 1st of August, a month ago. Uh, she was, it was taken uh, using a DSLR camera from the landing, from the landing window um, sink, as the planets were sinking towards the southwest horizon in the, in the early morning. This is a, a, an image of a Saturn at our position in 2018. Uh, and just to, to sh uh, prove that we, society members can image it quite well, this was Mark Phillips' image from 2018 when it wasn't very different to its present altitude. Of course, at the present time, both Saturn and Jupiter are fairly low down, so it isn't the best time to be observing them because you're looking through more of the atmosphere and you don't get as clear a view as you might. But as well as taking photographs, we can draw planets. And this was a drawing of Saturn made on July the 30th by Paul Abel in Leicester. You can see it's got cloud bands, but there's uh, no particular evidence of any, any spots. Uh, and similar to those you might find on Jupiter, but they do occur. And back in 1933, Will Hay drew this image of, of, uh, of Saturn uh, on the 3rd of August, 1933, uh, showing a white spot he discovered, a famous white spot uh, he discovered. Um, Saturn at this time wasn't very far away from where it is at the present time. Uh, it was in uh, Aquarius right next to where it is now. And uh, so it's, it's its appearance uh, was similar to that uh, shown here. And I, I, I have to point out that this is an inverted view. Many drawings of Saturn through an eyepiece show north as being downwards. So at the present time, we're viewing the north face of the rings, even though it looks as though 
in both these cases were viewing the south face of the rings. Will Hay was quite a, a famous person. Um, he, uh, this is a photograph of him with his telescope and uh, he, he, following his discovery, he wrote a book through my telescope, which, which covers uh, astronomy to a fairly shallow depth. You can actually download this. It's free to download online if you fancy a read. Uh, he was more important, more uh, famous though, as a comedian. Um, he was the first comedian to have his voice broadcast on the radio in Britain. That was in 1922. And by 1938, uh, he was the third highest grossing star in Britain's box office. Uh, he, this is him in his role as, as uh, of Dr. Muffin in The Ghost of St. Michael's. He was a man of, of many talents, talents uh, eccentric in some ways, as well as astronomy and comedy. He was also an early aviator, a pilot, and he even helped to teach Amy Johnson to fly. She became the first woman to fly solo between London and Australia. Before we leave Jupiter and Saturn, I just mentioned on the 24th and 25th of the month, uh, the moon is quite close to Saturn, uh, to the two planets. On the 24th, it's below and right of the moon. And on the 25th, it's just below Saturn. Let's turn our attention to the east at uh, these times, and you'll see Mars climbing up from the eastern horizon. Mars is stationary this month again uh, on the 9th. This time it's changing direction from easterly to westerly, so it's position throughout the month is in this little nook of, of Pisces where the two uh, lines to the two fishes meet up or tied together. It does get closer during the month. It gets closer between uh, 74 million and 62 million kilometers and it'll be hardly any closer than it is at the end of the month by the time it's closest to the earth on October the 6th and it's closest to the earth then but not in opposition until another week later on October the 13th because uh, Mars at that time is, is drawing um, away from the earth in its orbit. This is a, a, an illustration I showed earlier the relative sizes of Mars at the beginning and end of the month um, and Here's a drawing of Mars taken again by, well, this one by Paul Abel of Leicester on the July the 30th. It shows uh, a famous feature on Mars, uh, a darker area called Certis Major, uh, with a brighter area uh, called um, uh, the Hellas Basin, which is the third or fourth largest impact basin in the solar system, so it's thought. It's uh, 2,300 kilometers across, and it's seven kilometers below the average surface of Mars. Uh, though you can see uh, uh, the Certis Major and the Hellas in this image. This is uh, this this drawing is again inverted. So South Pole is here, and on this case, in this drawing, South Pole is down at the bottom here. This uh, computer representation, the South Pole is down here. Now, uh, on September the third, yesterday morning, Damien Peach took this image of Mars, and again it shows Certis Major. Here we are, and the Hellas Basin. And that was only posted uh, on Twitter this evening. Uh, there are two other planets on this view. Uh, one of them is Neptune, uh, which is uh, at our position in September um, at a distance of uh, 4,327 million kilometers on the 11th of September. Uh, it's 2.3 arc seconds across, so very small. Um, and uh, so that's an opposition. Uh, you'll need binoculars to see it better with a, with a telescope. Uranus, though, is not far away from Mars, magnitude 5.7, and it should be visible to the naked eye if you've got a dark sky uh, at a distance of around uh, 2,860 kilometers at the middle of the month. It's two, two thirds of the distance to Neptune and it's uh, 3.7 arc seconds across, nearly twice as big as, uh, as Neptune. Something else I wanna point out in this uh, diagram is overhead is the elephant uh, location of the elephant's trunk nebula. I bring this up because uh, it was photographed by Mark Phillips uh, this month. It's uh, 2,400 light years away and it's almost overhead at these uh, are our map times. Uh, it's dark cloud of gas and dust, 
uh, in which star formation is taking place. The glowing rim here is because the surface of the cloud is being ionized by a star which is off uh, the uh, left-hand edge of our image. This is a false color image taken using hydrogen alpha and oxygen three filters by Mark. And uh, I also want to focus on this area, area around Andromeda and Pegasus, because uh, uh, there is an eyesight test for you, and that's to count the number of stars you can see in the square of Pegasus. Uh, there are 13 stars in, in the square of Pegasus that are brighter than magnitude six. So if you can see those, you've, you've got a pretty dark sky. Uh, if you can only see three, then you're probably around magnitude five, uh, limiting magnitude. And if you can only see one, there's only one star there or none, then uh, it's, uh, the sky is, is magnitude, limiting to magnitude, uh, magnitude 4.5 or so. Of course, a famous object in this region is uh, the Andromeda Galaxy, which you find by following a line of the along the top of the square and across to Mirac and then make a right and reach M31. Um, and that's how to find the Andromeda Galaxy. There's an image taken of the galaxy, the central region of the galaxy anyway, by Nigel Goodman. Um, this I posted on Twitter recently. Uh, it shows two other galaxies, both of them dwarf elliptical galaxies associated with M31, the Andromeda galaxy, uh, this M32, and up here uh, is M110. And as well as uh, M31 down uh, in this region of sky, we've got M33. If you can find Mir uh, Mirac and then go right to M31, if you switch direction, go left, about the same distance is M33. Uh, Nigel Goodman took this image. It's a bit further away than M31. It's 2.7 million light years away versus 2.5 million for the Andromeda galaxy. And it's much more difficult to spot with the naked eye. Uh, and even through binoculars, I find it difficult. It's sometimes called a pinwheel, but I think uh, the pinwheel is really the, the more usual popular name for M101 in Ursa Major, which was one of the galaxies plotted uh, alongside the plow in an earlier image. Uh, Ian Smith uh, also imaged uh, M33 in Triangulum as a 90 degree rotation relative to the previous image. Uh, and it shows some colorful uh, uh, pinkish knots here, which are regions of star formation against uh, uh, along the galaxy's spiral arms. On tomorrow evening, the 5th of September uh, in the evening, you'll find the moon about three degrees to the right of Mars in our eastern sky as it rises. Uh, but by the following morning, Sunday morning, it's only 0.9 of a degree uh, below, uh, the moon is below and to the right of Mars. And in fact, there's an occultation visible uh, best in South America. I think it can also be glimpsed from uh, the south uh, western parts of Europe. That's a, a view of the two planets as you'll have on Sunday morning. Um, and uh, you'll also, you'll find that uh, Mars looks like this. If uh, Well, that's the pattern you might see on Mars, but I've put on there the grid, grid lines for latitude and longitude. At the moment, the um, Mars's axis is tilted 17 degrees uh, towards the Earth. The South Pole down here is tilted 17 degrees towards the Earth. Uh, and in fact, that we're now at midwinter on Mars. In fact, uh, I think it's tomorrow, uh, the winter solstice on Mars, when Mars's uh, south pole is tipped at 25.2 degrees towards the sun. And of course, Mars rotates every 24 hours, 37 minutes. So if you look at Mars the same time every morning uh, or every, every night, then you'll see about the same view of the, pad, uh, of the markings on its disk. And uh, Will Joy imaged the moon on August the 8th, and that's the same phase uh, that it will have, the moon will have when it, it meets Mars on Sunday morning. Now we're looking uh, in the eastern sky, but uh, at five o'clock in the morning, and uh, the obvious, obvious object here is Venus, which uh, this month rises four hours before the, before the sun and it's 33 degrees high at sunrise uh, in, in the eastern sky, and it stays that same time difference, the same altitude right throughout the month, because it's moving through the sky, uh, following the sun, and uh, 
tracing out uh, out that particular path towards the star Regulus in, in Leo, which is just at the bottom of the diagram here. On the 14th, uh, it's going to be four degrees below and right of the moon, and that's the view then. There's Venus, the moon, four degrees, and in the same field of view through your binoculars is M44, uh, the beehive cluster in, in, in Cancer, uh, Pricepi. And so this, this will make a nice uh, photographic or binocular target on the morning of September the 14th. And again, I showed this particular uh, uh, view, uh, computer generated image of uh, Venus, the beginning and end of the month. The phase is getting thicker, 60% to 71%. Uh, the, the brightness is about the same, but it's getting smaller and a smaller target for a telescopic view. Something else I want to mention towards the end of my talk now is Betelgeuse. Uh, Venus stands to the left of, of Orion in our morning sky now. Uh, and you remember that uh, towards the end of last year, beginning of this, Betelgeuse faded dramatically. And there was some, um, some, pe some people uh, thought that perhaps uh, it would be um, uh, lost in, in, the sun, in the sun's glare. Sorry, some people thought that it would be turning supernova. Uh, well, it recovered uh, quickly in brightness in, from February onwards, uh, before it became lost in the sun's glare. And uh, since then, it's re-emerged, and there were thoughts that it was fading again, although it seems to have recovered for now. This plot shows uh, the brightness, measured brightness of, of, uh, of Betelgeuse over the last uh, few months. Uh, this is the fading, which began uh, in November. I'm sorry about the dates being month, day, year. It's not, this is an American site, remember. Uh, it faded right down to magnitude 1.6 and, and fainter. It then brightened up before we lost it in the sun's glare. It then reappeared and seemed to be fading again, but just in the last few days, it's gone back up again, and it's now at around magnitude 1.7, 1.8. So there's been lots of speculation as to why it faded. Was it dust getting in the way or perhaps an outbreak of star spots? And quite recently, NASA has reported observations using the Hubble Space Telescope and claimed that the dimming is likely caused by a huge amount of hot material which was ejected into space. This then cooled uh, and formed a, a cloud of dust. This is the outburst from the star throwing out material. Materials that got further away from the star cooled, formed a cloud of dust. And we are happening from the point of view of the Earth to be in line with uh, the dust cloud. So it's hidden quite a chunk of the star's surface and caused the star uh, to, to, uh, to uh, fade. The dust was ejected at something like 90 kilometers a second. We don't we we don't know whether this has been the cause of any previous variations of of of, uh, of Betelgeuse that have been observed, but it's still worth observing. Uh, I think though the expectation that it is fading rapidly is now uh, uh, old old news, uh, and that's the end of my talk for tonight. Thanks. <laughs>